Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low-priced commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Blood Drunk Bridesmaid, Anji Maid of Dishonor. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commander will be up next for our Kamigawa Neon Dynasty builds. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Anji Maid of Dishonor is a 4-5 vampire that costs 2, a black, and a red with the following abilities. Whenever Anji Maid of Dishonor and or one or more other vampires enter the battlefield under our control, create a blood token. This ability triggers only once each turn. Pay 2 and sacrifice another creature or blood token. Each opponent loses 2 life while we gain 2 life. Breaking down her core stats, Anji is packing a mid-size CMC, very decent stats for her cost, and a pair of abilities that allow her to generate blood tokens as she and her vampire brethren enter play, and later turning that blood, or those who generated it, into AoE Drain. Her first ability is fairly straightforward, producing one blood token for us per turn so long as we're able to summon at least one vampire per turn, generating us a steady stream of blood for Anji and other blood-focused payoffs to take advantage of, and since blood counts both as an artifact and a token, it will be enabling any payoffs that care about that as well. And as mentioned previously, her active ability works very well with her passive, as it allows us to convert the blood she creates and from other sources from a loot effect to a decent sized AoE drain at a reasonable cost. And should Anji find herself low on blood, she can turn her sights on our creatures as emergency blood bags for the same effect, which makes her a fairly decent instant speed sack outlet from the command zone as well. So as you may imagine, any build worth its salt being helmed by Anji will both need a decent number of vampires to proc her blood generation, alongside other means of blood production, both of which our build will have in spades. But instead of this being a simple vampire tribal build with some blood tokens thrown in for extra reach, this build will seek to weaponize our blood tokens even further, turning them and other artifact tokens we'll be producing into value for us and damage for our opponents. Looking at our blood production first, we'll be running plenty of vamps that produce blood tokens. Whether they be one-time triggers for a small taste, or more consistent forms of bloodletting to keep it flowing all game long. Both of which work nicely alongside Anji to generate even more as they come into play. Then coupled with some non-vampiric means of blood generation, and we'll have plenty of the red stuff to ensure Anji's glass is never empty for long. And while blood will be the primary thing flowing, we'll also be aiming to generate some other types of consumable tokens such as treasure to supplement the number of artifacts we have in play, as many of the payoffs we'll be running don't exactly care about blood specifically, but artifacts in general. Speaking of payoffs, we'll certainly be running our standard blood token payoffs to work alongside our commander, but we'll also be running plenty more that care about those blood tokens being artifacts, and allowing us to turn them into sources of ramp, card advantage, and damage, expanding their utility greatly from just what our commander provides and turning them into the centerpiece of our game plan. But Anji doesn't really care about that so much, as she's already 10 glasses in and has even drunk the gluttonous guest under the table. No, she's more concerned about making the biggest scene she can at this joke of a wedding, and when a Falconrath makes a scene, you can always expect it to be a bloodbath. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting in the CMC1 slot, we have its trio of entrants with Voldaren Epicure, Dockside Chef, and Disciple of the Vault. Voldaren Epicure is a 1-1 vampire that, when it ETBs, deals 1 damage to each opponent and creates a blood token, making it a cheap source of tribal blood generation whose AoE damage gives us some extra reach. Dockside Chef is a 1-2 that lets us pay 1, a black, and sack a creature or artifact to draw a card, giving us a cheap and repeatable way to convert our blood tokens into card advantage that comes down early. Disciple of the Vault is a 1-1 that, whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from play, has target opponent to lose one life, tacking on a bit of extra damage every time we use up our artifacts, and even procking when our opponents lose theirs. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we start off with some blood token generating vampires with Restless Bloodseeker, Voldaren Bloodcaster, and Blood Tithe Harvester. Restless Bloodseeker is a 1-3 that creates a blood token in our end step if we gain a life that turn, and lets us sack two blood tokens at sorcery speed to transform it into Blood Soaked Reveler. A 3-3 with the same ability as well as letting us pay 4 in a black to have each opponent lose 2 life while we gain 2 life, its main usage being giving us blood tokens back the first time we sack them with Anji's activated ability on each of our turns, but its transformation allowing us to get some extra AoE drain in if we have the mana to spare. Voldaren Bloodcaster is a 2-1 flyer that creates a blood token whenever a non-token creature we control dies, and, if we create a blood token when we have 5 or more in play, transforms into Bloodbat Summoner, a 3-3 flyer that turns a blood token we control into a 2-2 flyer with haste at the start of our combat phase, transforming very quickly thanks to our deck's blood production and weaponizing our tokens by turning them into evasive flyers turn after turn for no mana cost. 
Blood Tithe Harvester is a 3-2 that creates a blood token when ADTBs, and we can tap and sack to give target creature minus X minus X until end of turn at sorcery speed, where X is equal to twice the number of blood tokens we control. Combining both a passable source of blood generation with a solid, if slow, blood payoff in the form of non-destruction removal, both of which are great for this build. Then a pair of non-blood-focused vampires join us with Blood Artist and Oath Sworn Vampire. Blood Artist is a 0-1 that, whenever it or another creature dies, has target opponent lose one life while we gain one life, making it a cheap vampire to drop early and start getting in more damage while creatures die on both our and our opponent's side of the field. Oath Sworn Vampire is a 2-2 that comes into play tapped and lets us cast it from the grave if we gained life that turn, working very well with Angie to sack it, then cast it again from the grave due to the life we gained from doing so, enabling us to sack it multiple times per turn if we have the mana, proccing any payoffs that care about creatures dying, and ensuring we get our blood token every turn if we have no other vampires left to summon. Then two humans close out this slot with Reckless Fireweaver and Jury Master of the Review. Reckless Fireweaver is a 1-3 that deals 1 damage to each opponent whenever an artifact ETBs under our control, serving as a free and repeatable source of AoE burn as we create our blood tokens turn after turn. Jury is a 1-1 that gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter whenever we sacrifice a permanent and, when he dies, deals damage equal to his power to any target, making him an ever-growing threat as we sack away our blood tokens and creatures for value, until he's finally dealt with, at which point he'll deal a significant amount of damage as a parting gift. Entering the CMC3 slot now, we have some more vampires joining our brood with Falconrath Forebear, Scion of Opulence, and Marauding Blight Priest. Falconrath Forebear is a 3-1 flyer that's unable to block, creates a blood token for us whenever it deals combat damage to a player, and lets us pay a black and sack two blood tokens to return it from the grave to the field, making it a superb source of blood token generation thanks to its built-in evasion, as well as being hard to remove permanently so long as we have a few pints lying around. Scion of Opulence is another 3-1, this one creating a treasure token whenever it or another non-token vampire we control dies, and also letting us pay a red and sack two artifacts to exile the top card of our deck and letting us play it until the end of the turn. It's passive treasure generation giving us more artifacts on board as our creatures die off, and it's impulse draw giving us another way to turn blood and other artifacts into card advantage. Marauding Blight Priest is a 3-2 that has each opponent lose one life whenever we gain a life, effectively upgrading Angie's activated ability to deal 3 for every sacked creature or blood token to help burn out our opponents that much faster. Another trio of bloodsuckers then join us with Silver Smote Ghoul, Vain Witch Coven, and Florian Voldaren Scion. Silver Smote Ghoul is a 3-1 that, on our end step, returns from the grave to the field tapped if we gained 3 or more life that turn, and lets us pay 1 a black and sack it to draw a card, its reanimation condition being very easily met by our commander, ensuring that we get value out of its own or other sack effects again and again with little setup. Vain Witch Coven is a 3-3 that, whenever we gain a life, lets us pay a black to return a creature from our grave back to hand, getting us further value out of our commander's on-demand drain to keep recurring our vampires as they're removed or sacked to keep the blood flowing. Florian is a 3-3 with First Strike that, on our second main phase, has us look at the top X cards of our library, where X is equal to the total amount of life our opponents lost that turn, exiling one of them and allowing us to play it until the end of the turn, while sending the rest to the bottom of our deck in a random order. At worst, allowing us to dig six cards deep into our deck by sacking a single blood token with our commander, making him an amazing source of card advantage and card selection with decent stats and keyword to boot. Moving away from vampires again, as we pass the halfway mark of this slot, we have Emerald Gear Smasher, Nadir's Nightblade, and Mayhem Devil. Emerald Gear Smasher is a 2-3 that lets us tap it and sack an artifact to deal 2 damage to each opponent, further allowing us to weaponize our artifacts for free once per turn to keep piling on the damage. Nadir's Nightblade is a 1-3 that, whenever a token we control leaves the battlefield, has each opponent lose one life while we gain one life, making Anji's activated ability 50% more effective and tacking on some free drain as we sack our artifact tokens for their own or other effects. Mayhem Devil is a 3-3 that deals 1 damage to any target whenever a player sacks a permanent, again allowing us to get some more value out of our blood tokens, creatures, and other permanents as we sack them away for value, as well as when our opponents do the same to tack on some additional bonus damage. Then we close out this slot with a trio of legendaries with Kesket the Flesh Sculptor, Gadric the Crown Scourge, and Lauren the Diversion. Kesket is a 1-3 that we can tap and sack three other artifacts and or creatures to look at the top three cards of our deck, putting two into our hand and one into our grave, giving us yet another repeatable way to turn our blood into card advantage for no mana cost as well as our creatures if we need to, all at instant speed. Gadric is a 5-4 flyer that can't attack unless we control 4 plus artifacts and, on our end step, creates a treasure token for each non-token creature that died that turn, coming online quickly thanks to our blood production to make use of its big evasive stat block, and lining our pockets with treasure as both our and our opponent's creatures die to put even more artifacts into play. 
Lauren is a 3-3 that has partner with Kambar the Plunderer and First Strike that lets us pay 2 and sack a creature or artifact to go to target creature, turning all our blood tokens into creature disruption with her on-demand goad, while also enabling us to tutor up her partner, more on her later, to get ourselves another blood production source straight into our hands. Proceeding to the CMC4 slot, we're back on the Vampire plan with some Mono Black entrants in the form of Sanctum Seeker, Vindictive Vampire, and Kambar the Plunderer. Sanctum Seeker is a 3-4 that has each opponent lose a life while we gain a life whenever a vampire we control attacks, kicking our damage output into high gear by weaponizing our vampires further as they swing in to drain our opponents alongside our blood tokens. Vindictive Vampire is a 2-3 that, whenever another creature we control dies, deals 1 damage to each opponent and has us gain 1 life, this time giving Angie's Sack ability a 50% boost if we use it on our creatures and giving us some incidental AoE drain if we lose them to our opponents or sack them in other ways. Kambar is a 3-4 that has partner with Lorraine the Diversion and Lifelink that creates a blood token and gains us a life whenever an opponent's creature dies, effectively tacking on create a blood token to all our removal spells and wipes, in addition to generating us even more blood as our opponents deal with each other's creatures, with the added bonus of tutoring Lorraine directly into our hands to turn that blood into solid creature disruption. Strephon Mara Progenitor then joins us as a Rakdos Vampire Entrant, being a 3-2 flyer that, on our end step, creates a blood token for each player that lost life that turn, and when he attacks, lets us sack two blood tokens to put a vampire from our hand into play tapped and attacking, as well as making it indestructible until end of turn. His blood production enabling Anji to turn one blood into three like some sort of perverse miracle, which he can then immediately put to use by cheating his brood members directly into play, making him one of the most potent blood token generators and payoffs we're running. Then we close out this slot with the non-vampire Fathom Fleet Sword Jack, a 4-3 that, whenever it attacks, deals damage to the defending player equal to the number of artifacts we control and has Encore for 5 and a red, allowing it to get in for a hefty bit of damage if we're stockpiling blood, which we can Encore back later for a huge amount of damage to all our opponents in the later game. Closing in on the end now, the CMC5 slot brings us even more vampire broodmates with Malakir Blood Witch, Champion of Dusk, and Wedding Security. Malakir Blood Witch is a 4-4 flyer with protection from white that, when it ETBs, has each opponent lose life equal to the number of vampires we control and gains us life equal to the amount of life lost, giving us a significant amount of drain on established boards to both deal damage and stabilize our life totals while leaving behind a decent evasive body afterwards to keep the pressure on. Champion of Dusk is another 4-4, this one drawing us X cards and losing us X life, where X is equal to the number of vampires we control, making it a solid vampire payoff in the form of card advantage, easily allowing us to reload our hands on established boards for only a nominal life loss. Wedding Security is yet another 4-4, which allows us to sack a blood token whenever it attacks to draw a card and put a plus one plus one counter on it, serving as a free tribal way to convert our blood tokens into card advantage and enabling it to grow into a bigger and bigger thread in the process. Then we close out this slot with God Eternal Bantu, a 5-6 with Menace that, when he ETBs, lets us sack any number of permanents to draw that many cards, and if he dies or is put into exile from the field, we may put him third from the top of our library, making him a resilient threat that's capable of turning all our unwanted blood, creatures, and permanents into card advantage while packing a beefy evasive stat block to swing in with after the draw. Finally, reaching the CMC6 slot, we have our last two vampires with Markov Enforcer and Olivia's Attendance. Markov Enforcer is a 6-6 that, when it or another vampire ETBs under our control, fights target creature and opponent controls, and, if a creature it dealt damage to dies that turn, creates a blood token, putting its huge stat block to good use with its repeatable fight effect and getting us some decent blood generation as it beats it out of our opponent's creatures again and again. Olivia's Attendance is another 6-6, this time with Menace, that, whenever it deals damage, creates that many blood tokens and lets us pay 2 and a red to have it deal 1 damage to any target, easily creating 6 blood tokens every single time it swings in for a massive donation to our blood supply and its damage effect, while expensive, still being passable removal and blood generation if we have the mana to spare. Finally, we have our last creature with Marionette Master, a 1-3 with Fabricate 3 that, whenever an artifact we control is put into the graveyard from the field, has target opponent lose life equal to its power, which will almost always be using its Fabricate to put 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it and make all our blood tokens do an additional 4 damage per 1 sacked for an insane damage boost to our deck. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Skipping straight to the CMT2 slot, we have Deadly Dispute, Reckoner's Bargain, and Costly Plunder, all of which allow us to sack a creature or artifact to draw two, the first also creating a treasure, the second gaining a life equal to the sacked permanent CMC, and the last having no additional effects, giving us a decent suite of effects that can turn our blood tokens and creatures into card advantage at instant speed with occasional upside. 
Then we have some removal options joining us with Terminate, Go for the Throat, and Heartless Act, all of which destroy target creature, the first preventing it from being regenerated, the second being limited to non-artifacts, and the last being limited to creatures without counters on them, removing three counters otherwise, all giving a solid and cheap instant speed removal to deal with any problematic creatures we may encounter. A Braid then joins us as our last entrant in this slot, which either has us deal 3 damage to target creature or destroy target artifact, making it a flexible removal option to deal with small to medium creatures or back row as needed. Moving on to the CMC3 slot, we have even more removal options joining us with Chaos Warp and Bedevil. Chaos Warp shuffles target permanent back into its owner's deck, then has them reveal a top card from it and allows them to put it into play for free if it's a permanent, serving as an incredibly efficient source of non-destruction-based removal that, while somewhat risky, is still worth running due to the sheer amount of threats it's capable of dealing with. Bedevil destroys target artifact, creature, or planeswalker, making it another flexible removal option that deals with a wide variety of common targets. Then we close out this slot and our instance with Vampire's Vengeance, which deals 2 damage to each non-vampire creature and creates a blood token, making it a good flash speed tribal mini-wipe to help clear the board of small creatures and tokens while throwing in some blood production as a bonus. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. It's single entrance all the way down in this category, starting in the CMC2 slot with Feed the Swarm, which destroys target creature or enchantment an opponent controls and has us lose life equal to its CMC. Its ability to deal with enchantments, which is something our colors struggle to do effectively, makes it well worth running despite the slow speed and life loss. Pointed Discussion then joins us in the CMC3 slot, which has us draw 2, lose 2 life, and create a blood token, giving us a simple but effective draw source that works well with our blood-focused game plan. The CMC4 slot then brings us Reprocess, which lets us sack any number of artifacts, creatures, and or lands to draw that many cards, like Bantu easily allowing us to cannibalize all our spare blood, unwanted creatures, and lands and turn them into card advantage to reload our hands if we're high on permanence but low on cards. Finally, the CMC5 slot brings us our last sorcery with Olivia's Wrath, which has each non-vampire gain minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is equal to the number of vampires we control, providing us with a non-destruction tribal-based wipe to clear the board while leaving most of ours intact. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Moving right into the CMC2 slot, we have Underhanded Designs, which lets us pay 1 whenever an artifact ETBs under our control to have each opponent lose 1 life while we gain 1 life, in addition to letting us pay 1 a black and sack it to destroy target creature if we control 2 plus artifacts, passively tacking on some additional drain to our blood production on the cheap and serving as an easily enabled emergency removal option as needed. The CMC3 slot then brings us our last two enchantments with Arterial Alchemy and Girapur Aether Grid. Arterial Alchemy, when it ETBs, creates blood tokens equal to the amount of opponents we have, and turns all our blood tokens into equipment that equips her 2 and gives the equipped creature plus 2 plus 0, giving us a decent supply of the red stuff as it comes down and literally weaponizing our blood for our handful of evasive and first striking creatures to take advantage of. Girapur Aether Grid lets us tap 2 artifacts we control to deal 1 damage to any target, effectively turning all our blood tokens, mana rocks, and all our other artifacts into manaless pingers for some extra on-demand damage, which is especially good if we've been overstocking our blood supplies. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Starting us off in the CMC1 slot, we have Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble, the first tapping for 2 colorless, and the latter letting us pay 2, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, both giving us some dirt cheap efficient ramp to help grow our mana base nicely in the early game. A pair of blood centric artifacts then close out this slot with Ceremonial Knife and Blood Fountain. Ceremonial Knife is an equipment that equips her 2, gives the equipped creature plus 1 plus 0, and has it create a blood token whenever it deals combat damage, making it a cheap source of recurrable blood production that works well if equipped to our evasive or big vampires to keep the blood donations coming from our opponents and their creatures respectively. Blood Fountain creates a blood token when it ETBs, and lets us pay 3, a black, tap it and sack it to return up to 2 target creature cards from our graveyard back to our hand, serving as a cheap source of blood early and some recursion later, or possibly something else if used by our other artifact sacking or using effects. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we have a whole suite of mana rocks starting us off, beginning with Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Talisman of Indulgence, which taps for our colorless or either of our colors if we take a damage, Racto Signet, which we can pay one and tap to generate both our colors, and finally Charcoal and Fire Diamond, both of which come into play tapped and tap for a black and red respectively. Oni Cult Anvil then closes out this slot, which creates a 1-1 colorless construct artifact token whenever an artifact we control leaves play, limited to once per turn, and lets us tap it and sack an artifact we control to deal 1 damage to each opponent and gain 1 life, 
continually spitting out extra artifacts as we sack away our blood tokens or even the tokens it produces, effectively giving Anji a free body to sack away on every turn as long as we have the mana, while also possessing a serviceable drain effect that triggers itself to boot. Finally, reaching the CMC3 slot and our last pair of artifacts, we have Inspiring Statuary and Glass Cast Heart. Inspiring Statuary gives all non-artifact spells we cast Improvise, which effectively turns all our blood tokens and other artifacts into mana rocks which tap for a colorless for most of our deck, providing us with an insane amount of ramp out of nowhere even if we only have a few pints of blood in play. Glass Cast Heart creates a blood token whenever one or more vampires we control attacks, and either lets us pay a black, a life, and tap it to create a 1-1 vampire with lifelink, or pay double black, tap it, and sack it along with 13 blood tokens to have each opponent lose 13 life while we gain 13 life. Its constant source of blood and vampire production helping Angie have no shortage of bodies or blood to sack for her effect, and the last ability, while being difficult to get to, can help turn a huge stockpile of blood into a massive AoE nuke if we have no other ways to get rid of it for value. That covers all our artifacts, and since we have no Planeswalkers in this build, let's move straight to our land base. Starting off with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Dragon Skull Summit, which comes into play tapped unless we control a swamp or mountain and taps for either of our colors, Smoldering Marsh, which comes into play tapped unless we control two or more basic lands and counts as both a swamp and a mountain, Shadow Blood Ridge, which we can pay one in tap to generate both our colors, Foreboding Ruins, which comes into play tapped unless we reveal a swamp or mountain and taps for either of our colors. Tainted Peak, which taps for colorless or either of our colors if we control a swamp. Path of Ancestry, which comes into play tapped, taps for any color in our commander's color identity and lets us scry one if that man is used to cast a vampire. Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for colorless and lets us pay two, tap it and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped. And finally Evolving Wild and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap and sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped. Then we have a trio of utility lands joining us with Bajuga Bog, Ghost Quarter, and Voldaren Estate. Bajuga Bog comes into play tapped, taps for a black, and exiles target player's graveyard when it ETBs, serving a straightforward and efficient graveyard hate from the land slot to blow out any graveyard focus builds we come across. Ghost Quarter taps for a colorless and lets us tap it and sack it to destroy target land, letting its owner replace it with a basic from their deck, giving us a way to snipe out any problematic utility lands our opponents may be running. Voldaren Estate also taps for colorless or any color instead if we pay a life, which we can only use to pay for vampire spells, as well as letting us pay 5 and tap it to create a blood token, which costs 1 less for each vampire we control, providing us with a good way to fix our colors when casting our vampires, as well as a cheap source of repeatable blood production once we get a few bloodsuckers into play. Finally, we're running 12 swamps and 11 mountains as our basics to close out our land base. So now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 35 creatures including the commander, 10 instants, 4 sorceries, 3 enchantments, 12 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 17 sources of blood token production, 10 cards that specifically care about blood tokens, 3 sources of artifact tokens outside of blood, 22 cards that care about any artifact token we create, 22 vampires, and 10 cards that care about vampires giving us a decent number of blood and other artifact token creation effects alongside payoffs for both, as well as a good amount of tribe members and support to work alongside our commander's tribal game plan. For general deck stats, we have 11 ramp sources, 11 card draw sources, 12 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes, giving us a stock standard amount of core stats for this build with no real outliers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 7 1 drops, 22 2 drops, 20 3 drops, 7 4 drops, 5 5 drops, and 3 6 drops giving us a decently low to the ground curve that aims to get Angie out as quickly as possible to begin her blood drive as we summon our vampires, then use that blood to enable both her and our other artifact payoffs in the form of value for us and damage for our opponents. Currently, this deck is valued at 6476, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, some additional blood-producing vampires such as Blood Petal Celebrant, Gluttonous Guest, and Falcon Rat Celebrants would be good includes for more blood production and vampire tribal synergies, while Bag of Devouring, Idol of Oblivion, and Trading Post would warrant consideration as well as additional ways to turn our blood tokens into value. For upgrades, Hellkite Tyrant serves as an easily achievable alternate win condition for us attached to a big evasive body and sporting a potent theft effect. Revel in Riches gets us more artifact tokens into play easily and also serves as an alternate win con all on its own. Bloodline Keeper is a superb vampire that gets us extra blood tokens by creating vampires on our opponent's turns and later powering them up. And Already Ingenious Iconoclast is a good source of artifact tokens and allows us to turn all our artifacts into removal. 
Finally, Dockside Extortionist can fill our coffers with treasure the instant it comes down for our artifact payoffs to take advantage of, but considering its price, it feels more like it's extorting us rather than our opponents. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. First things first, I'd like to thank every single one of my subscribers for helping the channel crack its 3k milestone. A little under a year ago when this series first started, I never imagined that it would grow this fast or that your support would be this strong. Thank you all for supporting the channel up to this point, and I hope you continue to support the channel as we continue to grow. Moving on to the results of last week's poll, it looks like Buckle Up was able to handily take the top spot in the Battle of the Precons. So we'll be featuring a Precon Upgrade Guide for Buckle Up on February 26th, then we'll be covering upgrades on Leash the following week of March 5th. And since we know what the next two weeks' episodes are going to be, we'll have no poll this week, but that doesn't mean that I still don't want to hear from you. So let me know in the comments below which commanders from Neon Dynasty you'd like to see on the first poll after we're done covering the Precon Upgrades. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank John for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, John, and thanks for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one, folks, and stay safe.